Hey everyone, today I'm joined by a really interesting guest. Really, really interesting. His grandfather was Joe Bonanno and his father was Bill Bonanno of the Bonanno crime family. Today's guest's name is Tor Bonanno. We talk about how his grandfather started the Bonanno family and how he ran it for 30 years, how he made his money, how he was able to run a family for that long. And ultimately, you know, what led to him going to prison for a little bit of time, you know, he never really did get caught, but there was an issue that did come up where he ended up going to jail or prison for a little bit. And we also talk about his father. So please hit subscribe if you want to get more interesting interviews like this. Without further ado, let's get into Tor's story. I want to talk about, you know, who your grandfather was and as well as your father, because they were both uh, pretty heavy in the Bonanno family, right? Well, they are. I mean, the Bonanno family is called the Bonanno family because of my grandfather, Joe Bonanno. Uh, he was one of the, when the commission, uh, after the Castel Marese Wars, and, you know, when the commission was coming together, um, you know, my grandfather was the head of the family, and that's why it was the Bonanno family, and uh, became one of the five commission members, you know, fam members of, of the commission. And um, the name has stuck through, you know, through all these years. So, um, you know, my grandfather was the was the Don Joe Bonanno. Joe Bananas was his nickname. He hated that, uh, but uh, that is what most people know him as. And then my my father, uh, everybody called him Bill. His real name was Salvatore. Of course, in the Sicilian naming tradition, he was, you know, oldest son was named after the father's father, and uh, that's why we're all, we all have the same names because my name is also Salvatore, but I was named after my my mother's father, uh, who was also named Salvatore. So, um, <laughs> And he was Salvatore Profacci, the uh, brother of Joe Profacci, who was the head of the Profacci family, by the way. Um, so um, right there, you know, so you have two of the, there's two of the five, you know, original families. Um, and my dad and my mom were both, you know, both their families were deeply entrenched in the tradition. So, Wow. See, I didn't even know about the other one but with your mom. Uh, that, that, that's pretty interesting too, you know, so we'll have to touch on that too. Uh, but I think first, you know, how we can navigate through it, you know, we'll talk about, you know, your grandfather and your father's involvement, you know, and how did, you know, you know, as your grandfather, you know, what was his early life like that, you know, that, you know, kind of made him want to pursue into joining the, or not joining, but starting the Bonanno family? Um, you know, he, he it just, you know, it's not something that you sign up for. Just, you know, it just kind of, uh, you know, happened. It was, you know, he had, he was an immigrant. He came to this country. It was, he was in this country as a youngster, went back to Italy. Um, and then as a teenager, you know, Mussolini had come to power and started cracking down on the school he was going to. In fact, they were, you know, the story he likes, he used to like to tell about how um, the academy, the Naval Academy he went to in Palermo, you know, the uniforms were all white. Well, when you know Mussolini came to power, they wanted to make them wear black shirts, and you know my grandfather led the you know the you know revolt or whatever you want to call it against the black shirts, um, and he ended up you know feeling the heat from Mussolini coming to get him. So that's when he you know talked to his uncle and they made arrangements for him to go to America, which he did, you know via Canada and then down to Cuba and then up through Florida. Okay. Uh, so he came to this country, you know, he went at that time he was in his twenties. Um, and of course, you know, the, you know, the guys from the old country in Costa Mari, you know, had sent word that he was coming, that he was there. Uh, in fact, they turned themselves into, you know, what then was, you know, I don't know what they called him. It wasn't border patrol. We call it border patrol now, yeah. but, um, whatever the authorities were. So they locked him up and, you know, they got a phone call and he called his cousin in, you know, Stefano Macadino up in uh, Buffalo and they sent somebody down and, you know, they got him out and, you know, eventually made it to New York. And then, you know, it was just like anybody, any other, you know, immigrant in New York in the, you know, twenties and thirties, they were just trying to find their way. Um, and then, uh, you know, he got, uh, there was a, a guy, Salvatore Maranzano, who was the, you know, the local Don, and, you know, they kind of took a liking to him, gave him a small job, and then he just kind of, you know, things happened. <laughs> Maranzano got murdered, and, you know, my grandfather was his right-hand man at the time. He took over, and, you know, he ran it from then. You know, that was in the 30s, you know, up through the mid-60s, you know. And, you know, during that time was kind of the golden era of the mafia. And, you know, because he, 
he was very thoughtful, very careful about planning, and he thought about the future. He wanted, you know, he made, uh, you know, he didn't really like, you know, Lucky Luciano, but, you know, they, you know, they knew that the, the best way to make money was if they all cooperated and there was peace. So, you know, my grandfather calls it Pax Bonanno, Pax being the P-A-X, the Latin word for peace. Um, you know, for 30 years, you know, they turned the mafia into one of the, you know, major factors in American history um, in the, you know, you know, in the 20th century. So um, kind of in a nutshell, in a big, you know, big umbrella, that's, that's the story. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, when he started this family, you know, did, do you know if he kind of started recruiting people or did he already have a crew? No, that's not how it works. They, you know, they were a group of men. Um, you know, that's a Koshinosa, our thing, you know, it's really just a group of men that, uh, you know, looking out for each other in the community. Um, and they don't recruit, you know, no one is forced in, you know, if you come and you need something, uh, yeah. And you want to, you know, you want to live by the code, you know, if you know, if you ask for a favor, you owe a favor. And, you know, a lot of the old Sicilians were just brought up in that code. It wasn't a code. It was just a way of life. Uh, when it came to America, it became more of a, you know, more of a code. And then over the years, they turned it, you know, turned it into an actual, you know, code of ethics. And uh, there was um, a way of doing things. So it was not, not a recru uh, recruiting thing. Um, you know, if they needed you or you needed them, you know, you came together because, you know, they were part of your community. Um, so, uh, you know, and as, grand as my grandfather got more uh, influence, you know, in terms of, you know, he was started a bakery, but he had a bakery truck. And of course, you know, they needed trucks when prohibition hit, you know, it all kind of came together and he was in the right place at the right time. And, and he was, you know, he was, he was a really educated guy. A lot of those people weren't educated. So uh, he kind of was natural leader, um, you know, became the leader, at, you know, as a pretty young guy. And, uh, you know, through his thirties, forties, fifties, and sixties, he was, he was the man. He was the boss. <laughs> he was the shit, as they said. Yeah. So, okay. So how many years exactly was he, uh, you know, uh, the boss of the family? Um, I don't know exactly how many years. No, I don't. I mean, it was from the 30s to the 60s. So 30 some odd. Uh, and he was involved, you know, in, uh, before that and after that. Uh, when he was in charge, I mean, officially, he, he you know, in the 60s, he asked uh, for the commission to, you know, let him... Uh, let him out and they did. So, you know, for historical purposes, you could say whenever that was 66, 67 was the end of his, his reign, but you know, uh, he had influence until the day he died, of course. Yeah. You know, so, right. So uh, how many, uh, or I guess, how, what was he really known for? Like the, the overall, the Bonanno family while he was running it, you know, what was their operations? Well, um, you know, the most famous one was probably the French Connection, um, you know, but that was in the 80s. That was after, you know, or 70s. And that was, you know, after he was gone. Um, before that, it was the commission, the whole structure of the commission. I mean, his book is all about the, you know, the commission. In fact, Giuliani used the book as a basis uh, for his prosecution uh, in the 80s, um, you know, because, you know, he used that to, you know, somehow working into that, you know, that, that was racketeering because it was part of the RICO Act and, you know, it was a conspiracy and he convicted all those guys um, pretty much based on, you know, the the structure of the commission that was outlined in my grandfather's book. Of course, my grandfather had no idea when he wrote it, you know, um, that Giuliani would use it in, in such a way because he was very careful about, you know, not um, implicating anybody who was still alive. Um, that's was, you know, because when he first wrote the book, I was questioning it and saying, wait a minute, what about this, you know, silence, this code of silence and, you know, this, you know, code among men. And, you know, he said, yeah, he's not, you know, that's, you know, that's, he's not breaking any science because everybody's dead. He was the only one of his contemporaries that was alive at the time. You know, what they did with, you know, after the fact and, you know, what happened with Giuliani. I mean, there was no way when he wrote the book in the late eighties that he can know what was happening, you know, 10, 20 years later. So, Right. So uh, that's what I was going to ask, you know, how, what was his departure with the family? You know, like what, what happened? What, you know, how did he make it out? Well, uh, that's, <laughs> that's not a, um, 
a story that could be put in a nutshell. I mean, that's a long drawn out, uh, you know, history, um, you know, of, of how the, you know, the banana wars in the sixties and how, you know, I was mentioned before, you know, the, the hit on Lucchese and, um, you know, and Gambino, the whole, um, you know, Joey Gallo, the crazy Joe, the Gallo thing and Joe Malioko. I mean, that, that is all, it all culminated in him, you know, in him leaving, um, you know, because they basically caused, you know, dissension amongst the families. And they even within the Bonanno family, there were some people, you know, that believed that he did that. He wanted to, you know, take over, you know, take over the commission, take over Arizona, take over California. I mean, part of the members of his own family believed that. Um, so it tore him apart and, you know, he wanted no part of that. And that's why he, you know, he said, Hey, I'm going to wash my hands of this and I'm out. And, you know, he was, since he was one of the original commission members, um, you know, because they knew they had sent, they did their due diligence, the commission members, you know, the other families. I mean, these guys were, I mean, everybody thinks of them as just big thug idiot gangsters, but, um, you know, the head of these organizations were pretty sharp, shrewd guys. And they did their due diligence. They looked into the story. They had, you know, guys investigate and they came back with, you know, they knew that Joe Bonanno wasn't involved in that plot to kill those guys. Um, and even though, you know, they knew it, uh, they weren't going to, you know, put a hit out on him knowing the truth. They went along with letting him, you know, basically banishment. And uh, you know, that's, at least that's from, you know, from my perspective, that's the way I see it. Yeah. So then he was able to, you know, like write the books, like you said, and not have to worry about, you know, these guys coming after him because he didn't, uh, impl uh, he, like you said, implicate anyone or, you know, he didn't, he didn't implicate anybody that was alive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So he never, nobody that he had personal dealings with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what and I always wondered. Okay. And he but, didn't talk about anybody that he didn't, you know, if he didn't have dealings with them and have personal knowledge of it, you know, he, he, it's barely mentioned. Right. Okay. It wasn't his style to even talk about that kind of you know, thing, unless he knew he had firsthand knowledge. Right. Okay. So you, you kind of talked about, you know, some of these wars, you know, what, what wars was he around and a part of during his time? Like, well, um, the, the Costa Marese wars back in, you know, the thirties, late twenties, thirties, I believe those were, but the, you know, the most famous ones are the ones that most people know about are the Gallo wars. Um, between the Gallows and Joey Gallo going after Papachi and Gambino and uh, and then which led to the Banana Wars, the Banana Wars of what the New York Times had labeled it. Um, and that's when the, you know, the family split apart because half of them, um, you know, believed that he was part of this conspiracy and the other half were loyal. Um, and there was dissension in the ranks and they were, you know, there were bodies piling up in the streets, as they say. Wow. And you know, with the the Gallo War, what what kind of started it was, you know, what 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 started it from your knowledge, with the Bonanos and the Gallos, crew. Well, yeah, I mean, when you know they were Gambino, I believe, uh, not Gambino, when I, I Colombo, that's his name. When Colombo, um, you know, said that he had that my grandfather had sanctioned a, um, the hit on Gambino and Lucchese. Um, you know, that's what started it for sure. But that wasn't true. He asked him how to get on the commission. He said, you got to make a spot. He didn't say, go kill those two guys. Right. He, he outlines it in the book and, you know, we can, you know, break out the books and, and, you know, get exact verbiage if you want. Um, you know, I don't know the history well enough to really, to really answer that question fairly. What I know is, you know, they got accused of, of a plot. And, you know, it ripped up, it, uh, you know, it caused friction. And then, you know, the whole Joey Gallo thing, um, you know, that's a long, that's a long history between uh, Colombo and Gallo and the Profacis. Uh, and he got drawn into that. So um, yeah. that's a great story. And, you know, it's very popular and it's very, you know, um, it's been told a million times and there's a thousand different versions of it. So um, the truth is out there somewhere. Right. And it's kind of hard to to find that, you know, with hearing all these other thousands and thousands of other ones, I'm sure. Right. I mean, everybody, you know, there's like I said, that's a story that's been been well told. And seems like every time I hear it, it's a little different. So 
Who knows right. what the truth actually was? I tend to believe what my grandfather says um, because I knew the guy and, you know, he had no reason to lie. And he, why would he lie to me? Why would he lie in his book? Um, so, and, you know, over time, it's proven out what's in his book is pretty true. And uh, just like, you know, this thing with the, uh, the new FBI informant um, or... For me, it was new, the new discovery of the tape of the FBI informant. So that basically clears his name and all this and, and verifies what he says in his book, right. his autobiography. When I say his book, it's a book of man of honor. My uncle, you know, Hank, we used to call him Uncle Hank, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if that, what his real last name was, but I know he got hit because it was on, I remember seeing it on the cover of the New York Times one morning and um, they told me when I was just a kid and they said, oh, he fell and hit his head on the curb. So... <laughs> Damn. And that's what, oh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know, you know, you know, what hit those hit, you know, the, the, um, you know, the big hits that everybody, you know, Paul Castellano and, uh, Carmine Galante, those were, you know, other families. Well, Galante was a banana family, but that was after my grandfather was out of it. And, you know, the, the name has stuck, but you know, he was, he's, they haven't been involved. Right. Okay. Uh, what about, you know, what was kind of, was there any downfalls of the family that really stood out to you that, you know, kind of brought the family down? Well, yeah, the, you know, um, the, fed, the nonstop federal prosecution is what, you know, brought them down. They got them, you know, they had the IRS, you know, they talk about weaponized Department of Justice and the weaponized IRS. I mean, yeah, they, the, um, you know, Kennedy's little bro, Robert Kennedy, um, you know, basically started that where they started going after, um, you know, the mobsters, you know, with the IRS, with the Department of Justice. And they they bled him dry. I mean, he was not about to not fight. You know, he was always up for a fight. So whenever the go government, you know, charged him with something, he you know hired the best lawyers possible and fought tooth and nail um, on everything. And he would not, you know, he sold all his land. He sold all his holdings. He sold everything to fight the fight the government and you know they didn't you know they didn't do too well they you know they got my grandfather my father and my uncle but they never got my grandfather well they got him for contempt for 18 months but he was never convicted of any crime so in his whole entire time he only got 18 right. the only time he went to jail was well they re he went to canada and they, they arrested him for a passport thing once and then uh and then they put him in, in court because he wouldn't answer questions, you know, about the commission. He just, you know, he and they put him in contempt for court. They asked him a few times. He said no. Brought him six months later, asked him again. He said no. Then after the third time, the judge just said, man, send this guy home. You know, he's not going to talk. <laughs> so they did. And that's the only time, you know, he did any time in prison. Right. So what about your, your father? What was uh, his part in the Bonanno family? Well... When he was in his, you know, in his 20s, he got um, involved because my grandfather had, uh, you know, had had a lot of, you know, they were having a lot of trouble in the 60s. And then when the when the um, war started, they you know, made him a consigliere. And, you know, that's part of what, you know, what tore the family apart. A lot of people didn't appreciate, you know, this young kid. He was basically a college kid from Arizona, you know, coming in and, you know, becoming second in charge, basically. So there was a lot of resentment there. So that caused, you know, the frag. But he was a young man and he was, you know, loyal to his father and he was smart and his father trusted him. So, you know, that's where he got, uh, he got sucked in, so to speak. And yeah. that was, you know, that was in the 60s, um, you know, but uh, his whole life, you know, he had been with his grandfather. He was raised in the traditions and the codes and he spoke Sicilian um, and, you know, he, he, he was, you know, he was a, he was a man of honor. He knew he was a mafioso. He would tell you, um, you know, what, when he was older in life, you know, what are you? He says, I'm a retired gangster. You know, <laughs> he was, um, he was, he was proud of it and uh, whatever he was, uh, whatever. I don't know what to say. Yeah. He was, he like, you know, he was not, he didn't shy away from it. Right. Okay. What about your uncle? You said he was part of it too. My uncle was 16, uh, 14 years younger than my dad. So, um, it was a whole different era. He wasn't really involved uh, in the, you know, in the sixties and seventies when things were, you know, pretty crazy. Um, by the time he got, became of age, you know, uh, they had pretty much, you know, retired to Arizona by that time. Oh, okay. So he didn't really have much 
to do or, you know, go on with the family or whatnot. Right. Since everyone already, you know, was kind of out of it. Okay. Well, and when you, oh. and, and I say, I have to make this distinction. You know, my grandfather always made it and so did my father that, you know, there's the Bonanno family and with the family with a capital F is the Bonanno crime family, the marketing arm or whatever this is now. And when he talks about the Bonanno family with the lowercase F, he's talking about, you know, my uncles, my brothers and cousins and stuff like that. So, um, you know, since the 60s, there's been nothing, you know, well, there's been a few things with my father in the 70s. Uh, but, you know, outside of that, there's, um, you know, there's there's really not too much to the Bonanno family with the lowercase F than any other family. It's just that their, you know, ancestors were famous. Now the Bonanno crime family with a capital F, you know, that's completely different. That thing, you know, lives on today and it's, you know, it's some name made up. Um, I mean, they've kept the name um, and who's in that family. They're not Bonanno, they're not Bonanno, blood Bonanos for sure, right? They're, right? But they're part of the Bonanno crime family or the Bonanno family of the capital F. So um, there's a distinction and a difference, right? So right. when you ask your questions, I've got to frame them all. And, is he talking, you know, about the lowercase F or the uppercase F? Of course, I know about the lowercase F. That's the life I lived. Right? Yeah. It's not very exciting. Um, you know, my brother's a doctor. My other brother's a cab driver. You know, I'm a project manager. My my sister runs a preschool or used to, um, you know, and that was their dream, right? That was the dream that their this generation would not speak Italian. We would have no accent and would be professionals. And that's exactly all my cousins. You know, they're insurance salesmen. Uh, carpenters, you know, teachers, none of us are, you know, in the life, so to speak. And that was the dream, right? That was the dream when they came to America that by this generation, you know, they wouldn't have to be looking over their shoulders and they wouldn't have to do, you know, loan sharking and numbers and all these other things to make a living because you would, we, we would have assimilated into the, you know, American society and culture and pretty much we have. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I mean, because you know, no one wants their kid to go through something like, like what they went through, you know what I mean? And right. I mean, if you have to, that's what they, you know, they did right. what they had to do, but they didn't want us to have to do it. And we haven't, fortunately. Yeah. yeah. So that's good that you guys are all able to, I mean, you know, you, you, you say boring, but I mean, it's just, you know, regular life, you know, you don't. Well, yeah, I mean, like just that. regular life. Exactly. So, yeah, no. So that's definitely I mean, not a, anything to, you know, that would sensational or anything like that. I mean, yeah, no, I know what you mean. So, you know, um, kind of going forward, you know, uh, I know you mentioned uh, your mother. She had a, a brother, right? Is that what you said? That was uh, on the, the Gambino. Oh, her father, Salvatore Profaci, was um, brothers with Joe Profaci, who oh. was the head of the Profaci family. Okay, so were you around these around these guys when you were growing up, like your grandfather? No, my grandfather friends? was uh, he he was whatever died in 1948 mm -hmm. uh, in a in a what they called a boating accident. However, you know this guy was on the sea his whole life, and then you know one day his boat blows up when you know. So they call it an accident, but you know I know my my father never believed that it was just an accident. You know so. Um, but so he died before I, you know, before I could uh, ever meet him. And, you know, Joe Profaci had died sometime in the 60s. Uh, maybe I was one. I, you know, I have no memory of him if I met him. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is, you know, like you said, I mean, two of the five families of New York, I mean, you know, were in your blood. So, I mean, that's. Well, yeah. And then my, you know, my dad's sister, Catherine, her husband is Greg Genovese. Um, so, and that was another one of the families, the Genovese family. So, uh, and my grandfather, you know, he, you know, you know, some people claim that it was, a, you know, arranged marriages and stuff. It wasn't, but they definitely helped it along. Um, you know, he, you know, he encouraged that, you know, the, you know, intermarriage among the families to help, you know, the bonds and, uh, and it worked, right? Because, you know, the Bonanos, the Genovese, the Pafacis, um, you know, they had a, you know, a good quorum on the commission and they ran things and they had a lot of success for a lot of years. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, 30 plus years. I mean, that's a long run, you know, especially to be a, you know, a boss for that long. I mean, cause after, you know, I don't know if you know, or you're, I mean, what's your knowledge with after, you know, he, he left, you know, was there different, all kinds of different bosses just coming and going through there? 
the well, the big the big one was you know Carmine Galante and that you know the whole you know when the drugs came in you know the money just blew up and everything kind of just exponential exponentially grew uh, you know after that with all the money you know from the narcotics and you know my grandfather was a staunch opponent to narcotics um, you know because because you know the money was so easy and so lucrative he knew it was you know guys would not want to wait and go through the you know the traditional process of you know working your way up through the family and you know doing you know, paying your dues so to speak when they could just go you know make a big score with you know coke or heroin and they didn't have to put up with this old man and his code and tradition and um you know my grandfather feels that's what really tore the mafia apart it wasn't the government it was the drugs and the money because the guys didn't need to follow the code anymore right because they could go out on their own and make their own money or you know, do it behind the, you know, the Don's back where in the old days, they wouldn't even think of doing that. Right. Right. But the money was so big that they couldn't ignore it. It was too tempting, you know, <laughs> and, you know, they did, they made a lot of money. And, you know, we know, we know there's big cartels now that make a lot of money because, you know, there's always a big appetite in the United States. Yeah, apparently so. I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that. I mean, you see the movies and everything, you know, and, you know, uh, I can't remember the one, but, you know, you know, the, the guy was, you know, selling drugs behind his boss, boss's back, you know, and didn't know and then ended up going to prison. And then, you know, then they, they had to cut him off after that. But, yeah, that's why I, I think you, you made a very good point, you know, that your grandfather said that, you know, it really brought them down. What about like, uh, you ever hear anything? About uh, you know the whole Donny Brasco, the Donny Brasco thing, you know. With well, the- yeah, I mean that was the Bonanno family uh, right. that he that he um, you know uh, uh, you know inf- infiltrated is the word I was looking for, um, and you know that was uh, you know that wasn't supposed to happen, you know, but uh, you know we all know it did, and um, you know that was a uh, you know, whatever it was it was definitely an embarrassment and. Um, you know, it was a popular one. So my dad became good friends with um, Joe Pistone, who was Donnie Brasco um, later, you know, later in life. And they uh, they wrote a book together, in fact, it's called The Good Guys. Uh, and it's a great book. I've been trying to get it made into a movie uh, for years. And I haven't had any luck yet, but I, you know, I don't think, uh, well, I'm not done and uh, it's not over. It's still a good story about how when the um, Russian mob came into Brooklyn in the 70s and 80s, uh, and clashed with the, you know, the Sicilian Italian mob, uh, you know, over territories and, you know, different rackets. Uh, so it's a great story. And one, one chapter is written by my dad, the same story, but it was told from my dad's perspective. Then the next chapter is told, you know, the FBI story and it was told by Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. No, I, I, I mean, that, that's, that's got to be something, you know, because, you know, I mean, he, I don't think he would have been in around the same time that he took down the Bananos, right? Your dad and Joe Pistone. Um, yeah, there were, I mean, that was just after they left. But, um, I mean, after my dad and grand, my grandfather had, you know, whatever, uh, when he retired to Arizona. So it happened just after that. Damn. So he could have been, they could have been enemies or something, you know, but instead, you know, they end up writing a book yeah. together. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they know they appreciate it. I mean, he was doing his job. They were doing their job. I mean, that was just uh, happened to be, you know, on the other side, you know, each side of it. But, yeah, later in life, they had, you know, no personal beefs with each other. And, um, you know, whatever came of it, you know, nothing major, at least for the Bonanos with a small F, nothing came of the whole Donnie Brasco thing. For the Bonanno crime family, yeah, that was a, that was a big deal. So, um, anyway, he didn't have any, he didn't have any issues with Joe Pistone and yeah, they got together and wrote that book. So. Damn. Yeah. That's pretty cool. You know? Um, so I'm trying to think, I mean, I think we pretty much covered all that I was going to ask. I mean, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Well, um, you know, I'd like, to, I, if I had known, you know, you were going to ask about the Gala Wars and, um, I would have, I would have, uh, refreshed my memory and, and got some more facts on that, but you know, that's key to the, you know, that, that whole gala war thing is the key to pretty much the, the mafia as far as like from the sixties on, I mean, it, it shaped, reshaped everything in the sixties and seventies. And, um, 
and like I mentioned, there's still implications of what, you know, of what that started then now. And um, I don't know, that's, that to me is, is key in the history. And then, you know, it led to the banana wars, which tore, you know, which made, forced my grandfather, you know, out of New York, which um, for me personally, that was a big thing, right? All of a sudden he was, you know, cause that's when I was born in 63. Um, you know, so the first couple of years of my life were very, um, you know, chaotic and I was in Brooklyn and then, you know, then we moved out West and everything uh, normalized after that. Yeah. So, I mean, as a kid, you know, I mean, when you knew him, I mean, he wasn't even, you know, active as uh, the boss, right? Um, I mean, he wasn't, you know, wasn't active, no, as the, uh, as a boss, but, you know, he still uh, had bodyguards around him and he had, um, you know, there was always men or soldiers around, you know, um, and they, uh, you know, they, they treated him with reverence and deference and, you know, a lot of respect. Uh, so you knew he was different, even as a kid, um, you knew something was, something was up there because, you know, they were, you know, he was the only one they were doing that too. Well, him and my dad, but not, they didn't respect my dad as much as they respected, of course, you know, Don Papino is what they called him. Um, they, uh, you know, everybody treated him with, you know, respect. And you could feel it when he walked into a room, you know, there was just this tension or, you know, this, this vibe that we call it now that he gave off that, you know, every, you always knew when he walked into a room, you know, and he knew that and he knew, you know, he was always dressed to the nines and, you know, looked good. He was, you know, never let himself be seen, you know, disheveled or, you know, in shorts or anything like that. He was always dressed and, and ready to go. So yeah, even as a kid, I knew something was different about him, but when you're a kid and that's your life, you know, that's normal. It wasn't until high school and college that, you start comparing your growing up with other kids that you say, oh, that was something, you know. But when you're in it, you're a kid, it's that's normal, that's your normal, right? Right. You don't that's know any different. Know. Right. That's all you know. <laughs> all I know is I had a lot of cousins, we had a lot of fun, you know, and there was always <laughs> parties. So who cares what those old people were doing in the back room? We were out playing football or something. So. <laughs> right. No, I mean that's that is something, though, man. I mean, you definitely have a lot of uh, family ties to the American Mafia, the, the the five families, or I guess the three of the five families. So, no, that's pretty cool, man. Not a lot of people can say that, you know. So, you're definitely one to have, have be a good guest on here, man. And I appreciate you coming on and, you know, giving me some time. Did you have? Do you have anything that you want to, you know, promote or links or anything that you want me to put in the description below? I mean. Or anything that you want to shout out? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody you can, you know, put a plug in for, you know, grandfather's book. Um, and then I can, you know, Al, if you send me your address, I can get you a copy of The Good Guys, the book that he wrote with uh, with Joe Pistone. I happen to have a, a few extra copies of that. You know, yeah, still yeah. Around. They're out of press, but, you know, we had a couple of extra boxes. I could definitely send you one of those. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. So, yeah, that's, you know, that's all I have at, you know, at this point, I know I should, I mean, I know these guys like, you know, French Haze and, and Sammy the Bull, they're making, you know, 50 K a month on uh, merchandising. So I got to come up with something to plug. Yeah, <laughs> um, you, know. yeah you definitely do. Tomato sauce. Yeah. Yeah, something, yeah, something to do with it, you know, but no, I mean, just looking at you, I mean, you know, and seeing your grandfather's interviews, you definitely got his face, man. I can, I can, I can just see a very, very good res resemblance, man. It's crazy, you know? But uh, well, you know, I'll I take that as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, uh, I appreciate it. And thank you again. All right, man. And uh, let's keep in touch. And uh, if I can help you in something else, just let me know. Well, what'd you think? I mean, he got a really interesting story. You know, his grandfather was Joe Bonanno and his dad was Bill Bonanno. I mean, that's not an everyday kind of thing. You know, I mean, not, not a lot of people can say that, you know, so I really thought he was a great guest to give great insight on this. And he is living what his grandfather wanted him to live, you know, a regular life, you know, not being involved with organized crime. Tor is investing in himself by having a regular legitimate job and spending time with family and, you know, just living the American dream, as they say. So please don't forget to hit subscribe if you want to get more interesting interviews like this. And if you want to support me, I got merch behind me. I got hot sauce. So please check that out. I'll put a link in the description. Also, tour is going to be a part of the documentary that I've been working on. So please hit subscribe so you can be the first to get that when it comes out. Also, I'll leave a playlist at the end of this video so you can watch all my other Mafia interviews. Thank you for watching.